from the uh, introduction, the short history of the war on earth from stones to drones, but it's abbreviated so we won't get to the drones. War is humanity's deadliest activity from 500 BC to AD 2000. History records more than 1,000 major wars. In the 20th century, 165 wars killed men, as many as 258 million people. World War II claimed the lives of 17 million soldiers and 34 million civilians. In modern wars, 75% of the people killed are civilians. The U.S. is the world's leading purveyor of war. It's our major export. According to Navy historians, from 1776 to 2006, U.S. troops fought in 234 foreign wars. Since the Pentagon's retreat from Vietnam in 1973, U.S. forces have targeted Afghanistan, Angola, Argentina, Bosnia, Cambodia, El Salvador, Grenada, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Kosovo, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Nicaragua, Pakistan, Panama, the Philippines, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Yemen, and the former Yugoslavia. Scorched earth war on nature tactics involve the destruction of crops, livestock, water supplies, and are a proven means of subduing targeted populations. During the American Revolution, George Washington employed scorched earth tactics against the Iroquois nation. During the Civil War, General Sherman laid waste to 10 million acres in Georgia, and General Sheridan incinerated Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. At the Battle of the Somme in World War I, where 57 thousand British soldiers died in just the first day of battle. The high wood was left a burnt tumble of blasted, mangled trunks. And with the outbreak of World War II, the European countryside suffered a renewed onslaught. Even today, 70 years after the war's end, bombs, artillery, and mines are still being unearthed. about oil, war, and nature. When asked what it was that triggered the war in Iraq, former CENTCOM commander John Abizaid spoke candidly. He admitted, of course, it's about oil. We can't really deny that. Here's a stunning insight. The Pentagon needs to fight wars for oil so that it can fight wars for oil. The Pentagon runs on oil, 340,000 barrels a day. Washington's global empire depends on oil. And forget miles per gallon, the war machine's fuel use is measured in gallons per mile and barrels per hour. A B-52 bomber can burn 47,000 gallons in this, on a single mission. And an F-16 fighter on afterburners can incinerate $300 worth of fuel in a single minute. And the amount of burned fuel, naturally, increases whenever the Pentagon goes to war. And whenever you, you burn fuel, you create emissions. At its peak, the Iraq war generated more than 3 million metric tons of global warming carbon dioxide every single month. In 2009, the US military spent more than $16 billion to purchase bulk fuel from 10 major oil suppliers, including Shell, Exxon, Valero, and British Petroleum, BP. And here is the unseen headline. Military pollution is a major cause of climate change. The Pentagon generates 5% of current global CO2 emissions. The total of all the world's military combined to 15% of the global pollution excess. And despite the fact that the Pentagon remains the world's singest greatest, in, greatest institutional consumer of petroleum products, it is a privileged polluter because it is exempt from all reporting requirements for its use of oil and its generation of pollutants. This exemption also covers all of the 1,000 plus U.S. bases 
currently in 130 countries around the world. It also exempts the 6,000 facilities in the U.S., along with aircraft carriers, tanks, jet aircraft, weapons testing, military exercises, and all multilateral op uh, operations, including NATO and AFRICOM. The fact is that the military's scorched on earth tactics have become so devastating that we now find ourselves living, quite literally, on a scorched earth. Industrial pollution and military operations have driven, driven the planet's temperatures well close to the tipping point. In pursuit of profit and power, we have effectively declared war on our biosphere. And now, as we were warned, the planet is striking back with an onslaught of extreme weather. But an insurgent Earth is like no other force a human army has ever faced. A single hurricane can unleash a punch equal to the force of 10,000 atomic bombs. Hurricane Irma's tab could top $250 billion. Maria's toll in Puerto Rico alone could top $100 billion. The uh, cost of the massive and spreading wine country fires continues to grow. And speaking of money, the World Watch Institute has reported that redirecting a mere 15% of the funds spent on weapons globally could help to address many of the causes of war and environmental destruction, including drought, famine, and poverty. So why does war persist? Because the U.S. has become what we might call a corporate militocracy, controlled by the arms industry and the fossil fuel interests. As former Congress member Ron Paul has noted, military spending mainly benefits a thin layer of well-connected and well-paid elites who are terrified that peace may finally break out. Today, our survival is threatened by gun barrels and by oil barrels. To stabilize our climate, we need to stop wasting money on war. We can't win a war that's directed against the very planet that we live on. Trump supporters firing assault rifles at oncoming hurricanes are not going to save us. We need to put down our weapons of war and our tools of plunder, negotiate an honorable settlement, an honorable surrender, and sign a lasting peace treaty with the planet. That's the end of that one. Yeah. Could you say anything more about the fires happening not too far from here? You mentioned the wine country fires, um, their kind of implications and connections to the themes of your your book? Well, the wine country fires are just uh, the latest and potentially, historically, the worst example of the predicted devastation that's going to be a consequence of changing climate. The temperature has notably risen uh, within our lifetimes. The planet has been transformed. Uh, Bill McKibben has uh, pointed out that we're essentially living on a brand new planet that no humans have ever in, uh, 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 faced before. The uh, superstorms fed by uh, increased thermal load, the uh, drying of, of uh, landscapes, the uh, uh, excessive uh, uh, abuse of the land, the uh, improper uh, and now anachronistic cultivation of certain territories that are going to be, uh, in the very near future, uh, unsuitable for agriculture, for wine growing. Uh, massive forest die-offs have, have uh, killed millions of uh, trees and, and hundreds of acres in, in California's uh, uh, primary forests. These uh, tendencies are becoming trends and it's going to pose a real challenge to humankind to try to establish an equilibrium between our behavior and the kind of kickback that we have triggered on behalf of the biosystem. The, the biosystem. Um, it's like nothing we've ever faced before. Uh, 
there's some hopeful signs. Uh, Puerto Rico has been devastated. Elon Musk and uh, uh, has, has come in with a suggestion to rebuild the country in an entirely new way uh, so that it's renewable and it's sustainable and the, uh, the, the uh, habitation is more durable in, in uh, a future of, of high storms and storms, storm surges. Um, it's already uh, the idea of floating a balloon over Puerto Rico a balloon project to reestablish communications that have been wiped out by these uh, 19th century, uh, in many cases, terrestrial systems with uh, standing power poles, transmission lines. Uh, that's something that's not sustainable in, in this uh, new climate regime. Uh, so we have to be very creative and come up with uh, new forms of shelter and communication and agriculture that are as much as possible weatherproofed against extreme climate change. And if we can't do it, we're gonna to have to behave like uh, all of the other living uh, creatures on this planet, and we're gonna to have to start migrating. We're gonna to have to leave the places that we can no longer uh, tolerate behind us and move toward the poles. Essentially, we're gonna have a refugee problem on this planet, the likes of which we've never seen. It's bad now, just with all the refugees from war, and in good measure, refugees from from uh, climate change, including the folks who were driven out of the farmlands of Syria and into the city by a drought, which led to the civil unrest and the war. But now we're going to have major climate refugees compounding the problem. We have refugees right outside our doors in this bookstore. We have a county full of people that day by day increase in number, people who totally lose their homes, the landscape has been leveled to a degree that is, is really uncommon and, and in, in my experience, relatively unseen. And these, these bizarre landscapes of uh, rubble out in the valleys of Sonoma and Napa, where the only thing moving is the flicker of burning gas from the ruptured pipes. They're like little votive candles all over in a sea of, of cinder and, and uh, uh, blackened ash. Uh, and the occasional broken uh, water line spurting uh, little plumes of water, sometimes side by side. It's, it's uh, uh, like nothing I've ever seen before. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions? I'm wondering about, um, you know, all of this harm is going to affect poor people, like the fires, you know. People have modest homes and lived on fixed incomes. People of Puerto Rico being wiped out, not really getting the scale of help they need to actually rebuild. And so, um, do you speak to that angle of the, the effects of militarism on people directly and then the environmental harm caused by the militarism on people? And um, what people in the book uh, kind of speak to the economic problem then? Well, that's actually two questions. One is how do human beings respond to losing their homes in a natural disaster? And the other is, what is the nature of the disaster that the military empire imposes on people's neighborhoods? Uh, people who live near military bases, be they American or any other country, are prone to uh, uh, a lot of excess noise, transit, pollution, uh, toxic uh, spills, uh, burn pits, um, intrusions uh, into their own culture, and uh, in many cases, yeah, the loss of their homes. If, if uh, the military needs uh, additional property for a landing strip, they're gonna send in the bulldozers to remove the, uh, the homes or uh, uh, remove the, uh, the, the farmlands, the crops. And there's uh, most often uh, no recourse for the people who are displaced. Uh, and we have uh, bases around the, the world where 
people are lined up at the gates protesting on a daily basis because of the intrusion into their uh, uh, their own worlds. It's an uninvited and unwanted annoyance. And uh, in many cases, if it hasn't already disrupted people's livelihoods, it's, uh, it's a constant threat to do that uh, every day of their lives. I guess so in your book, uh, is there a section about that and wanting to relate it to the book? And so how does that come out in, the, in, in your book, in your exploration? There are a number of uh, reports by people who uh, were firsthand uh, witnesses uh, in areas where military, uh, primarily U.S. military bases were uh, being built and uh, protested and uh, criticized in Sardinia, in uh, uh, Japan. Uh, there were a lot of pieces that I couldn't get into the book. I wanted to have uh, a chap uh, an essay on uh, the struggle over Jeju Island. Um, there's a chapter on uh, burn pits, which is a problem both uh, uh, overseas and domestically. The U.S. Uh, military has a nasty habit of creating these uh, half football sized uh, foot, uh, burning pits where everything that they don't uh, want, can't find a better way to get rid of responsibly, uh, they put it all into a big pit, uh, be it uh, furniture, paper products, uh, old chemicals, ordnance, uh, uniforms, uh, obsolete electronics, uh, uh, human wastes, uh, uh, spoiled food, uh, even human body parts that wound up in these burn pits. The whole mass is then covered with kerosene, with jet fuel, J5 jet fuel, and ignited and left to burn. It creates uh, great uh, amounts of smoke, which people wind up breathing, and uh, live not full lives to regret. Uh, there, uh, there's also a, a chap, uh, an essay in the book devoted to the downwinders, people who live downwind of America's uh, Southwest nuclear testing sites, which uh, in many cases were uh, atmospheric and in many other cases were supposed to have been uh, subterranean, but they breached the topsoil and wound up spewing radiation downwind. Uh, radiation typically went toward an expendable population, uh, Native Americans and uh, Mormons, I'm sad to say, were also downwind. Uh, and occasionally the winds would shift and blow the, uh, the fallout westward toward Los Angeles, California. So as uh, one of our contributors, James Larriger, pointed out, the United States actually conducted a nuclear war on its own people. The U.S., you know, we live in fear of, of the prospect of somebody hitting us with a nuclear weapon. It's very unlikely. But, not unlikely, in fact, a historic reality is that our government has already done that. Our government attacked our country with hundreds of nuclear weapons. And in the process, wound up creating tens of thousands of cancer cases and a lot of deaths. Would you like to ask a question? We were probably going to wind up early since oh. people didn't really come we're both with Gar, but okay. if you have a question or an observation, uh, well, yeah, feel free. Through. Not having read the book or <laughs> read the book yet, but uh, since uh, they're uh, um, on the on the matter of say electoral politics, I'm, I'm wondering, um, did you cover did you cover any of that in your talk? The election election results and the status quo that we're facing now. Oh yes, yeah, I was able to uh, mention uh, Donald Trump in my uh, opening introduction. His, uh, his sad history and his, the mounting embarrassment of his administration, right. uh, Chaos Incorporated. Uh, Trump has uh, spoken very carelessly about uh, nuclear weapons. Right. At one point he famously said, if we can't use them, why do we have them? And now there's a dispute about how many additional weapons he wants. Um, he's, um, he's not, <laughs> uh, he's not so many things. 
the simplest construct is he's not presidential. Um, and I, I hope that um, there will be some heft behind a proclamation that was read in Congress today, uh, articles of impeachment. Uh, presumably at this point it's not going anywhere, but you have members of Trump's own administration who have signed a suicide pact against this guy, and they are letting it be known to the press that he is not to be trusted, that he is not a responsible person, that he has to be stage managed, that he has to be, you know, they have to be there with the straight jacket. And that's, that's one of the few slim hopes that we have. Even before the election, Hillary Clinton and everybody else was saying, he does not have the temper temperament right. to have his index finger looming over the nuclear button. Sure. Yeah. And uh, there is a bill in Congress now that is uh, designed to ensure that no president will have the ability to unilaterally begin a nuclear war. Uh, that's how clear this danger is. People in Congress are now writing bills of impeachment and writing laws to circumscribe what the president has always been able to do. But finally, with Trump in the saddle, we realize how irresponsibly reckless it was to give any one person control of the nuclear football. So you think the reports are credible that some of these people on the inner circle who are his minders would, are ready to dive for it if he goes? die for, for the football or whatever and take it away from him? <laughs> uh, I, would, I would hope even the, the person carrying the football uh, yeah. would, would refuse. Uh, I, I spent some time once with a war planner, a Pentagon war planner, and he had this exercise that, that, he, would, <laughs> that he would pull on, on the uh, participants. It was a war scenario, nuclear war was looming, the president had to make the decision. The president decided that he was going to launch, he was going to reach for the nuclear codes, but in this scenario, there was no nuclear football. The codes had been surgically implanted in the body of a fellow soldier. And when the participants were told that the only way that they could start a nuclear war was to murder this man and carve out the electronics, they all said, we can't do that. That would be murder. So maybe we should get rid of the nuclear football, too. Hmm. But well, I think the, the current <laughs> Trump we probably agree. would be willing to kill somebody. Oh, yeah. Um, but well, not, not personally. Yeah, he would right. order it. The, well, um, in view of, you know, in, in, Thinking about the, the political situation we're in now, I'm not sure how to put this exactly, but um, when in, as this election campaign unfolded, one could see a lot of uh, discord within the, the, the party in opposition to Trump, where people, or a lot of people who said they couldn't support Clinton, for example, mm -hmm. because the, the uh, didn't see a lot of difference, but I mean, what uh, if you had to characterize it, or what would you say that we have to gain from supporting, say, the, the liberals and, and the, you know the, the democratic sort of status quo of Obama and Clinton, as opposed to, or, or, or what do we stand to lose mm -hmm. if? if they, even if they, as in, in I, I'm assuming that, like when, say Obama was in office, he wasn't able to or, or willing to or interested in doing a whole lot to scale back the military power in the country. Yeah, and, and maybe no Democratic president or liberal president would be able to. But what, what, what can we? What, what do we gain? as opposed to from having, say, a Clinton in power? Well, I, I don't think we would have, 
You know, one of the reasons I was I was not voting for Clinton uh, was because she seemed on a track to collide with Russia, right. which could lead to a third world war. Right. And she seemed the bigger threat than Trump. I didn't think Trump was going to get elected at that point. Right. And by the popular count, he didn't. Um, but the status quo is also the enemy of, of the people. Um, we need to have a new status quo. Obama talked a wonderful talk. Uh, he, was, he got a, a Nobel Peace Prize for uh, promising to rid the world of nuclear weapons. And then he wound up being the fellow who signed the contract to uh, spend another trillion dollars over 30 years to modernize the nuclear arsenals. Why did he do that? Uh, I think that gets back to the problem of the, the uh, corporate militocracy. Uh, the country is not governed by the people. The engines of, uh, uh, of this country are fueled by corporations. Uh, the military runs on oil. America's politicians run on cash. And you need a whole new cast of characters in the states, in the legislatures, in Washington, who are not subservient to political payola. We saw a glimpse of what that could be with Bernie Sanders. Uh, to my mind, Bernie doesn't go far enough in tackling the, the war party problems. Uh, but he did give what he called an anti-war speech. And that's a good beginning. He's acknowledging that there's something to talk about. It's not just health care. Uh, it's survival. And we have a closing window of opportunity because of these externals, including climate change and all the destabilizing possibilities that it offers. We have a limited amount of time to fashion this new status quo. Uh, but it's, we cannot coexist with major corporations that profit from war. Uh, and it's not just the major defense companies, so-called defense department, call it the war department as it used to be. These are war profiteers, they aren't defense contractors. Boeing, Raytheon, General Electric, General Dynamics, uh, Lockheed Martin, they are hugely profitable, hugely powerful, hugely insinu insinuated in America's communities. In every state, there's jobs at stake, it's, it's political, you got to increase the budget, you got to make sure that your constituents are getting well-paid government jobs building weapons to kill other people in other countries. And then you've got the banks that invest in these companies. And uh, it's an infrastructure that we do not have any latch hold on. They are autonomous. Uh, a few things can bring them down, uh, economic collapse, Maybe in three months we'll have a global economic collapse as people have been predicting for several years. Three months from now it's all gonna to topple, the petrodollar is, is a fiction. Even that, that, that word itself, petrodollar, what does that tell you about our economy? It, was, it used to be tagged to gold, the gold standard, now it's standard oil. Uh, and you know, can we really build up an alternative from the grassroots? We've been trying to do that for a long time. But if you've got a tent over the grassroots, you're not going to be able to grow much because they're blocking out the sun. They control the water. Uh, we have a lot of problems. And I don't have big enough solutions, but we have a lot of really small, promising solutions, whether they're going to add up to a large enough number to counter the problem that we're facing remains to be seen. But we've sure got to try.